Hello, and welcome to another episode of Something Rhymes with Purple. This is a weekly podcast where my, Giles Brandreth, and my friend, Susie Dent, we get together and we talk about words and language. Susie, is there anything that frightens you? Is there anything you're scared of? Anything about which you have a phobia? Yes, it's funny, isn't it? I see phobias and being scared of things as slightly different things. So when you say scared, that for me conjures up images of ghosts and poltergeists. So that's, for me, that would be kind of scary. But phobias are much more, I find, much more deeply rooted. And I do have a couple. One of them I have mentioned before. I remember when I mentioned it both on Purple and on 8 Out of 10 Cats, just count down the comedy show that I work on. I got lots and lots of people saying, yes, I have that, when I thought it was such a strange one. But it's a fear of wrinkly fingers. Do you remember? So I don't like my fingers being immersed in the bath or a swimming pool. In fact, if I'm swimming properly, I'm okay. I can forget about it. But if I'm just splashing about with kids, I have to have my hands above Mm. the surface of the water because I just can't stand the feeling of wrinkly fingers. And the second is much more commonplace, and that is clowns, coulrophobia. Because as a child, I think I really didn't like loud noises. And Clowns for me were all about unpredictability and also they have that really sinister side to them, don't they? So those two I would say. I don't think they have that really sinister side to them. I'm a clown person. I like clowns. But what is the word for a fear of clowns? Coulrophobia. But actually, it was like many, many, I'm sure, of the phobias that we're going to talk about today. You know, they didn't have clowns in ancient Greek times. Most phobias are named after ancient Greek, particularly, um, sometimes Latin as well. And so I think they looked not to a clown, but to a a walker on stilts for coulrophobia. I think that's the literal Uh, definition of it, but it's applied these days to a fear of... Would your fear of wrinkled fingers be called prunophobia? (laughs) Well, I call it pruny digitophobia. Oh, very good. That's your invention, is it? Pruny digitophobia, yes. But pruny is definitely not ancient Greek, so it doesn't cut any muster at all. Well, I invent words too. I invented lingua basophobia for the fear of tripping up when saying a word. Ah. Newsreaders, interestingly, if they've got a a complicated foreign word to pronounce, they're so anxious about it, they get through the word that was difficult, and then the next phrase is an ordinary word, and they trip up on that. Yes, like the Diana Dawes. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we won't we yes. won't tell that story again unless there's a special request. If you want the Diana Dawes, Diana Fluck story <laughs> and haven't heard it before, <laughs> please get in touch with us. It's purple at something else.com and only at your invitation will we retell this tale. But yes, one of the words I've always dreaded curiously is the word misled. Whenever I see it, I want to say yes. misled. Yes, absolutely. And they are called misled or misled. And that might might make an, a nice subject for an episode, actually, because, as you say, you want to say that. And actually, there's no hyphen or anything to help you with misled. There was once upon a time. So we should do oh. that, actually. Words that just come out all wrong because we have... Like an emony. Yes. An, an enemy or is it a... An emony and hyperbole and all of all that. Of that. Uh, anathema. Yes. Anyway, let's stick with phobias now. Let's talk about phobias. And I suppose I, even I know where this comes from. Phobos is Greek for fear or horror. And yes, absolutely. Give us the basic ones. I mean, there, there are genuine phobias that everybody has. You have fear of clowns, which is not uncommon. Some people mm-hmm. uh, have a fear of, well, actually, I have a, it's a rational fear of going on a roller coaster, and I don't like horror films either. Um, no. You know, almost the first date on which I took my wife back in 1968 was a Dracula film. I thought it would have her leaping into my arms. In fact, it had her hiding under the seat. But I think, <laughs> is a phobia irrational or is it rational? Because mostly people have a phobia about spiders, don't they? That's an arachnophobia, as I remember. Yes, and that's, that's That irrational, is irrational because most spiders say. are harmless, aren't they? But not all. Not all. If you're living in Australia, then there's more of a justification, I would say. But yeah, that's a really interesting one. I mean, we ought to get the psychologists of amongst the purple people to tell us how much rationality and, and how much irrationality is involved. I'm not sure. But a spider's definitely a big one for many, many people. You can undergo exposure therapy, can't you? Where you can actually handle 
one by the end of it. There's hypochondria, which is a kind of phobia, I suppose, but doesn't have phobia at the end of it. But that's just a fear of illness. What doctors call the, what is it, the well, the worried well. Oh, yeah. um, then you have a fear of flying, perhaps, which again could be deemed rational. Aerophobia. You have a fear of heights, which is acrophobia. The acro there is linked to acrobats, the acropolis, because it's all the idea of a summit. Astrophobia, which is a fear, not of stars, actually, but of thunder and lightning. I think that's probably a more recent coinage. A fear of storms, which I love a good thunderstorm, I have to say. It's one of my great enjoyments in life. No, I agree. It clears the air. It's quite exciting. Yeah. Autophobia, not a fear of being in a car. But you could probably get this one, auto. Auto, auto. Autoimmune. Autoimmune. No, I've not got it. It's a fear of being alone. It's a fear of oneself, oh, really. good grief. Auto meaning, yes, self. So something is automatic, it operates by itself. An automaton, all of that. Those are all linked. So autophobia is a fear of being alone, being on your own. Yes. Ooh. Whereas, of course, we've talked very recently about oclophobia, which is a fear of crowds. So it's the opposite. It's a fear of being outside and exposed to a lot of people. There is haemophobia, which is linked to hemorrhage, of course, which is a fear of blood. Again, a lot of people suffer from that one. And so it goes on, really. Trypanophobia is a fear of needles. So anyone who is about to be vaccinated might have a certain amount of dread in their hearts, even though, obviously, it's a really good thing to do. But uh, trypanophobia, that one. Famously, Mark Twain said, man is the only animal who blushes or needs to. I don't know whether it's true, but I think erythrophobia is a fear of oh, blushing. Oh, yes, fear of blushing. It I mean, is. I can imagine that. Did you ever, when you were younger, go through a period of blushing unnecessarily? I'd love to blush. I think blushing is actually really nice, and I never do. I was at school with a girl called Helen who blushed a lot, and I was secretly quite envious of her, actually. So, no, but I can totally understand, and, of course, it's self-fulfilling, because the more you worry about it, probably the worse it gets. So we've got animal phobias, phobias of the natural environment, yeah. things like being frightened of height and darkness and thunderstorms, these medical phobias broken bones, uh, injections, blood, all that, and specific situations like being alone. What was the one for being mm. alone in? Autophobia. Autophobia. Fear of flying. Aerophobia. Aerophobia. And what yeah. about driving? Yeah. That could be autophobia as well, couldn't it? What's that? Maybe that's... <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, they wouldn't have had cars in ancient Greece, so they would have had the chariots. And, of course, chariot is linked to cars. It's, it's interesting. I posted something on Twitter the other day about words that are contractions of things that just... Uh, it seems quite obvious when you hear it, but you might never actually get there. Car deriving from carriage of course, and goodbye, another one that we've done quite recently, from God be with ye. And then I started thinking, of course, car is a descendant of the chariot as well. So maybe they did have one in ancient times, a word for fear of driving a chariot, but if they did, I don't know it. These phobia words, some of them obviously are, are brand new. They're sort of amusing ones brought, invented really, to get you right up to date. But others are, are go back a long way, like claustrophobia or claustrophobia. And agoraphobia. Yeah. These are proper yes. old Greek origin words, aren't they? One is for agoro is, I know, Greek for the marketplace. So that's a, a fear of yeah. open large spaces. Claustrophobia is mm -hmm. a fear of small spaces. Yes, and actually that goes back to the Latin claustrum or claustrum, meaning a lock or a bolt. So it's a fear of being kind of locked Do you have in. that? I have that. I can't bear it. I once was asked to do some tunnelling for a television film. Oh, yes, I, I couldn't do that. Speleology, I could, not, I could do that. not do that. And I found it quite difficult when I was in pantomime doing a puppet sequence, being in a little box with the puppet, waiting for my big moment. Ah. But they have to do that. I, a year or two ago, I was hosting the Oldie of the Year Awards. The Oldie is a British magazine celebrating people of riper years. And we were giving an award that year, I think, among others, to Dame Judi Dench and to Basil Brush. Basil Brush is a puppet. See, I used to be quite scared of Basil Brush. I used to have Basil Brushophobia <laughs> as well. There was something very kind of aggressive about him, well, I found. What, what is the Greek word for a fox? Maybe that's what it should be called, foxophobia. Well, yes. Anyway, I agree. I don't know. Basil Brush, to my amazement, turns out to have a person who helps work him. I feel I'm giving away a state secret now. It is actually a puppet. I'm going to reveal that. I'm sorry if I'm upsetting people. There is a Father <laughs> Christmas, but Basil Brush is a puppet. So the point was there was to be a lunch 
And then after the lunch, Dame Judy Dench was to get her award and then Basil Brush was to get his award because he'd been being Basil Brush for 70 years. And he arrived at 12 noon, the character who helps Basil Brush come to life. And uh, he said, where do I go? I said, well, you know, you're not on till 3.15. It's 12 noon. He said, well, I've got to get into position. I said, but you're on for three and a quarter hours. He said, never mind. So he clambered into a box uh, the size of a small letterbox, which was hidden under the table and had a white tablecloth put over it. So it looked as if it was part of the dining table. So that when the moment appeared for him to appear, all I had to do was pull off the tablecloth and up would pop Basil Brush. But the point is, this guy, who was Basil Brush's carer, to put it kindly, he was in this tiny box for three and a quarter hours while a whole lavish lunch was served on top and around him. I could not do that. No, I could not do that either. I've just looked up, actually, when you were talking about fear of caves. There is someone has coined speleophobia for a fear of being underground and locked in that. One of the scariest films I ever saw when I was little, and I mean really little, and I wasn't clearly supposed to see this, so I'm not quite sure how I did, but it was of a woman being buried alive and then being stuck in her coffin and not able to... You know, it's the kind of the, the situation where a lot of people think saved by the bell and dead ringers and all of those things come from. The phrases aren't actually attached to those, but what a fate. You say that, you throw that in as if everybody remembers it. What you're telling us about is that people in ancient days used to have in their coffins a bell... Uh, so they could... They, yeah, well, they didn't, actually. This is all a myth. The reason I, I glossed over it is I think we've talked about it before, but, yes, it's a bit of a myth that people would be saved by the bell by ringing from their coffin underground or that they were a dead ringer. But they're great myths. I want to know if it's true that Arthur Conan Doyle, or was it Houdini, had a telephone buried in their coffin. Oh, yes. Because they both believed in the possibility, or one did and one didn't, the possibility of afterlife. And they were going to, I think maybe it was Arthur Conan Doyle. Maybe purple people will know that. And had mm. a coffin, had a telephone buried in the coffin so they could get in touch. But oh. what was it attached to? Was it, uh, this must be another urban myth. Pre-mobile, presumably. The fear of being buried alive, there must be there must be a word for that. And I don't know it, but I now definitely It's have extreme it. claustrophobia, isn't it? Absolutely. It is, yeah. I have fear of flying, I'm afraid. It's ridiculous. It's, yeah. it's aerophobia, isn't it? Um, it is, me too. I used to love it. I used to love turbulence. I used to embrace all of that. And then I had one particularly horrible, horrific flight where I didn't stop shaking for a week and that was it for me. Yeah. No. I've enjoyed not, not flying for a whole year. That's been one of the upsides. I know it's yeah. awful if you're in the airline industry and I know the world must carry on flying, but frankly, if there's a train, yeah, I'll take it. I'm with you. I'm just looking at, at some of the lists here. How can anyone have a fear of trees? Trees are just, I mean, I'm a dendrophile, but you can be a dendrophobic. As what's well, a dendrophile? Or a dendrophobe. What's, what are they? Dendrophile is a lover of trees, ah. and a dendrophobe is a hater of trees or someone who fears them. I guess there's quite a lot of kids' stories, and you know, think of the Wizard of Oz, where the trees can be quite malevolent. Come to life. I love those in the Wizard of Oz, but they are terrifying. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yes, the whole idea, the Grimm's fairy tales, where they go, you know, you go into the forest and the benevolent grandmother turns out to be a wolf. Scary trees at night. That's where you might be frightened of trees. Maybe. Maybe. I just think they're the most majestic things in the world. I just love the way that people, you know, if I were to look up now, I'm going to look it up, actually. Fear of being buried alive. Sorry to linger on this horrible okay. subject. Sure. <laughs> Someone has come up with one. There you go. Taphophobia, which goes back to the Greek taphos, meaning a grave or tomb, and phobos, obviously fear. An abnormal fear of being buried alive as a result of being incorrectly pronounced dead. So there you go. I suffer from a rational vertigo in the sense, well, I say it's irrational, it's a genuine vertigo, put you on top of a building. Yeah. In Britain, if you see political reporters within the background, the House of Commons on television, they usually are standing on the roof of a building called Church House, which is several hundred yards away from the House of Commons, but you get a good view of the House of Commons from this roof. Yeah. And the, the parapet around the roof is quite shallow. So whenever I'm up there filming to have the House of Commons as the background, it's quite nerve-wracking for me. What am I suffering from? Um... Is it a fear of heights? I suppose it is. I think it would be, yes. And what's and that then called? That's acrophobia, remember. And that would be a symptom of acrophobia. 
But sometimes they're so nuanced, aren't they? Because these phobias only apply to certain situations. And I think the terms are slightly umbrella-like and, and don't fit every single thing. Here's another one for you, which I definitely suffer from from time to time. Spectrophobia. Can you guess what that one is? Colours of the rainbow. You don't like the colours of the rainbow? Different, no. Odd colours. Some colours you don't like. Fear of mirrors. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. A fear of mirrors. Again, this... some of these will be quite whimsical. That is whimsical. Why do you have a fear of mirrors? Because of seeing yourself or because well, I think... the horror of not appearing in the mirror, that you look in the mirror and there's no one there? Oh, no. It's simply when you're feeling idiorepulsive, which is another word for self-repellent, I think you don't want to, you know, particularly night after the evening before or similar situations and particularly during lockdown you know when actually we don't really need to look in mirrors very much and then suddenly you catch sight of yourself i know it is quite bleak in the morning i sometimes get up feeling quite jolly <laughs> and i pop into the bathroom and then i, I think oh I'm, I'm young and i'm full of life and energy and i peer into the mirror <laughs> and suddenly this old man looking like stepto senior appears and i think <laughs> oh dear has it come to this it's cacophony. You are full of vitality, fuller Thank than you. most people I know, I have to say. OK, what about gelophobia? It's not jelly. G-E-L-O-P-H-O-B-I-A. Gelophobia. No, uh, cold. Ice. No, you have to know your classics for this one because it's actually a fear of laughter. Oh. And I only knew this one because there's another word in agilast, which is somebody who never ages. And I think it's because they don't get laughter marks and wrinkles. So who wants to be an agilist? As in the picture of Dorian Gray, the As young man the who the stayed attic. young while the picture in the attic grew old. Exactly, exactly. I mentioned cacophobia just then. That, yes. I think, is a fear of ugliness. Yes, although you could extend that and have it as a fear of excrement because oh. that's its ultimate root. Really. Oh, as in caca, the French for excrement. Yeah. Absolutely. And as in cacistocracy, government by the worst of citizens. So that's the Latin version, C-A-C-O, but it goes back to K-A-K-O in Greek. And that Something means audio. Appalling. Yes. yes. What was that word for government by the worst? Cacistocracy. So aristocracy began as government by the best of people. So it's the Greek aristo, meaning the best. And cacistocracy is government by the worst of citizens. And those go back to ancient times. So the aristocracy, yes, was supposed to be the pick of the population. But of course, it soon took on, you know, because it was mostly people who were well to do and elite, it took on those overtones. That's wonderful. Tell me about glossophobia. Glossophobia is a fear of, it's kind of really a fear of words, but it's fear of public speaking in its, you know, common sense. So it's glosso as in glossary. Yes. Gl exactly. Glossophobia, so a fear of, of words and using words. So if you are glossophobic, you can say, I, 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 I afraid I can't say a few words at this event. I'm exactly. glossophobic. Exactly. The opposite of what you are. I have a fear of public speaking, even though I do it all the time. And curiously, it doesn't get any better as but the years go by. You I are know. on TV the entire time. Don't tell me you're, you have some kind of fear of it. I wouldn't believe that. I think I'm talking of public speaking. But oh, okay. I suppose being, appearing okay. on television is. Isn't that interesting? You see, I wouldn't have mm. thought of appearing on television as public speaking, but you might have millions of people watching. I mean... But you don't get a sense of it, do you? Yeah. Exactly. If you stand up in a room and there are 100 people or 500 people or 1,000 people, the stomach churns, for me, still, even though I've been doing it for 50, 60 years. Glossophobia. I have mild glossophobia, but I try to... Conquer it. Give me hmm. some more of these unusual ones. I'm liking the weirder ones. This is a really, really weird and very recently coined one. Arachibu... Sorry, it's, it's almost impossible to pronounce. Arachibutyrophobia. It's ridiculous. What does it mean? The fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Well, that's a real condition. So I'm, I'm uh, quite yeah. sympathetic to that, actually. I loathe that feeling. And what's the word again? Do you? I, I think that I would associate it with rhubarb and that horrible feeling you get behind your teeth when you eat rhubarb. I love rhubarb. But you know what I mean? If you get a particularly bitter bit of rhubarb, it's actually a similar sensation on your teeth to the one you get on your fingers when you're emptying the dishwasher. All my phobias are coming out at once now. Yes, arachibutyrophobia. I mean, don't try and pronounce it with peanut butter in your mouth is all I would say. I think I'm getting phobophobia. <laughs> yeah, me too. Does that exist? Fear yes, of, fear of fears. Oh, really? You're, you're getting apprehensive about getting apprehensive? 
Well, I think it's that thing that you just you say, well, I'm not worried this morning, so I'm worried that I'm not worried about something, so I'm going to worry about it. Well, people, of course, in the run-up to schools reopening around the world and certainly around the British Isles, some people have been suffering from scolionophobia. Yes, school phobia. I, I understand that, a fear of going into school. I mean, I do sometimes think that these words are so impossible to pronounce, as we've just heard, <laughs> that actually they're not particularly useful and they are there simply because people wanted to have a bit of wordplay, don't you think? Yes. Well, some things are genuine. Uh, I had an aunt who suffered from something called Dorophobia, as in Dora, but not Dora Brian or Dora the name, but Dora as in fur, a fear huh? of fur. And that was rational because the fur made her come out in sort of spots. She got a rash. Mm. So that that is sort of legitimate. Are you talking about fur accoutrements or fur on any living animal? Yeah, fur on a living animal. Fur, oh, okay. you know, touch, touching fur. But she also was quite sensitive. She also suffered, I think, from uh, clinophobia, which was a fear of going to bed. Yes. And that on the other up... hand, clinomania is the overwhelming desire to lie down, which most uh, of us oh. have felt during lockdown. And it's pronounced clino, is it? Clino, you know, I, I pronounce it clino. It could be clino because you've got recline and all of that stuff. The ancient Greek scholars amongst us can correct us, but that's how I pronounce it. And people suffer from clinophobia, fear of going to bed, because they're fearful that they may never wake up. Wake up, yeah. So they, you know. Oh. What's yeah. oikophobia? Do you know? Oh, an oikophobia. Oh, now, this is really... a. a I read this one the other day and I remember thinking, doesn't it sound anything like? Exactly. Is that fear of housekeeping or something? Well done. You're, that's very, very good. I thought of it because you're mentioning aristophobia, you know, fear mm. of aristocrats. Oikophobia is not a fear of oiks. It's a fear of home. Things to home. do with the home. Oikophobia. Is that strange? Well, I've got one for the purple people because I'm hoping that none of us actually feel this. Porphyrophobia. Guess what that is? Well, I know there is that disease called porphyra that members of the royal family in the Victorian times were said to suffer from, some purple disease, something to do with purple. So yeah. it's to do with purple. It's fear of the colour purple, is it? Porphyrophobia. colour purple. Indeed. If you go back to the Greek porphyra, they were mollusks that yielded this crimson dye that then when applied to cloths came out in the colour that we today call purple. And there was also a purple stone called porphyry. And we've talked before about how the dye was so rare and so expensive. It was used for colouring the robes of Roman emperors and magistrates and things. But yeah, that's it's the fear of the colour purple. None of us have that. Some of these words are giving me the heebie-jeebies. Should we take a break and then come back? And you can explain to me the origin of being scared, oh, out of my wits. This is Something Rhymes with Purple, and we're talking phobias today. From zoophobia, which I think is the fear of animals. Would that be right? Yes, or zoophobia, I think it would be. Of course. Yep. What about yep. pogonophobia? Fear of beards. Fear of beards, that's a funny one. And what yeah. about cherophobia? Mm, how are you spelling that? C-H-E-R-O phobia. No idea. Well, exactly. I think it's just one of these made-up ones. A fear of cheerfulness. Who'd be frightened of oh. people of being cheerful? That's ridiculous. Well, do you remember, oh, by yes, the way, when I was talking about contractions earlier, do you remember that watcher... As in watcher, that we used to sort of say if we went into the pub on, in the 1990s, mm -hmm. is contraction of what cheer. How are you? Oh, as in watcher yeah. cock, what cheer. Yeah. what cheer. My old hearty. Gamophobia. <sighs> Fear of gammon. No. Fear of marriage. Correct, G-A-M-O. <laughs> well done, you. You know it all, don't you? We had fear of trees earlier on. Uh, phylophobia. What could that be? P H Y. Double L O. A P H Y O. Uh, leaves? Correct. It's not yeah. pastry. Some people think it's fear of pastry, but it's not. <laughs> Phytophobia is a fear of leaves. And this is a genuine one, too, I think. Rather as claustrophobia is for me a genuine one. Anginophobia. Fear of a heart attack? No. A co well, according to. Fear of being strangled. Oh, uh, even worse. No. Uh, apparently a fear of narrowness. Ah, uh, OK. So angina is, is all about, uh, it's from the Latin for strangling or choking. Angere, uh, that's why I said that. So you're going down a very narrow passageway. Yeah. You know, in Venice, 
We all want to get back to Venice. Some of the calais are very narrow between streets, really, really yeah. narrow. And you can begin, it seems quite wide, and as you get to the end, it gets narrower and narrower. And I find going through narrow points quite frightening. OK. Do you remember that amazing film, Don't Look Now? Oh. oh God, that was so scary. That gives me the heebie-jeebies. Julie Christie, amazing. And Donald Sutherland, what a film. Anyway. Let's just talk about some phrases related to being scared. Yes. Heebie-jeebies I've given you. Yes, heebie-jeebies. So remember, we've got all sorts of rhyming phrases in English. We've got mumbo-jumbo and hocus-pocus, willy-nilly, shilly-shally, helter-skelter, all sorts of things like that. And that's what's going on here. So it's a bit like, in Britain, we would call it the screaming abdabs, wouldn't we? Which is another strange one. So hebe and jeebe independently don't really mean anything. But heebie-jeebies was coined at a time when people loved creating these kind of rhyming duplicative compounds, as we call them, or rhyming reduplication. So this is the time of the bee's knees, the kipper's knickers, the elephant's adenoids, cat's whiskers, etc. So this takes you back to 1920s, America 1920s, where there was a feeling of kind of post-depression gaiety and exuberance, I suppose. And 1923 is the first record we have of Hebe Jeebies, which was in a cartoon, I think, in a New York journal or magazine. But it caught on really quickly. And it always did sort of be giving somebody the heebie-jeebies is giving them the kind of, you know, the, the spooks. But we don't quite know who was the first person to use it. It might have been in that cartoon or they might have been picking it up. But it was interesting because this reminds me of Brandress Pills. It was really popularised by an ad for laxer cold cold breakers and it said if you got the heebie-jeebies don't worry all you need is some of our cold breakers so that probably popularized it quite a well, bit and indeed brandreth bills were advertised if you've got the collie wobbles well um, there you go so there you go these yeah. are Vic victorian phenomena the victorians liked being scared before the advent of the cinema and horror films in victorian times there were melodramas that were truly designed to scare the living daylights out of people oh yeah First of all, do you like having the living daylight scared out of you? And how long has that phrase been with us? Do I like it? Yes, if I'm with friends and not completely on my own listening to scary podcasts. But yes, I do. So this goes back to, I think, the idea of eyes. Your eyes were your daylights in the 18th century. So to darken someone's daylights was to give them a black eye by punching them or knocking them senseless. And then you would beat someone's daylights out of them. I guess it's the idea of, it's kind of scaring them out of their wits, only that's sort of the idea of, you know, that the life that's reflected in your eyes. If you scare the daylights out of them, you're almost killing them through fear. And living was often used as a general intensifier, so that was kind of added on for extra effect. Scared out of my wits. Mm. That's being well, driven mad, I suppose, by something that's so frightening. Yes, exactly. So your wit, we kind of think of wit now as some sort of, you know, ability to be incredibly funny and quick. And indeed, it does, of course, mean that. But originally, it was the seat of consciousness and thought and of memory, too. So your inwit was your inner knowledge, your conscience, if you like, where outwit was your perception of the world outside. Common wit was common sense. Nitwit actually came along much later, not until the 20th century. So nitwit, sadly, isn't part of this. But obviously, if you're Wit, you don't have any sense at all. And those meanings of your sort of mind and your knowledge explain things like keeping your wits about you at your wits end and scared out of your wits. Let's put fear behind us, though. If there are people listening who have got phobias that they'd like to share with us or a phenomena that they feel don't have a word for the phobia that they're suffering from, no doubt Susie can come up with an appropriate word for you. Do get in touch <laughs> with us. It is a purple at somethingelse.com, and that's something without a G. Have people been in touch with us this week, Susie? Well, they have, and the first one is one that I simply cannot answer. It comes from Imogen Marie Booker, who probably knows that one of my favourite etymologies is daisy, the flower, the day's eye, because it closes its petals at dusk and opens them again at dawn, so it was the eye of the day. I love that. But she has asked nothing about the etymology, really, but all about who the first cow was named Daisy and why has it stuck? In other words, oh. why, why do we call it Daisy the cow? And I, honestly, I can't find the answer. But so I'm relying on the that. purple people. 
Yeah. Oh, that is the most wonderful question I think we have been asked in 102 episodes. Imogen Marie, how fascinating. I've always loved Daisy the Cow. I know it certainly goes back to Victorian times because being a student of traditional English pantomime, Daisy the Cow is featured yeah. in pantomimes since the 1800s. So Daisy has been around And there's often a Daisy a sticking out of the mouth, isn't there, as well? Yes. Yeah. Da who, which was the first Daisy the Cow? Oh, how wonderful. I'm so glad. Do you know, this whole podcast, these last two years, this has been but a journey along a pathway leading to this moment. I feel <laughs> the sky has opened. Oh, purple person, Imogen Marie, what a question. By the way, thank you for letting us know who you are, but you don't have to let us know who you are. We've had a, 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 a fan in New York City. That's how he or she described themselves. And they've written to us anonymously. A co-worker recommended your podcast and I've been hooked ever since. I thoroughly enjoy the linguistics aspect of your show and the very British style and culture that seeps in. Is a fun, if sometimes confusing edition. That's quite amusing. I think this is coded talk. I thoroughly enjoy the linguistics aspect of the show. That's you, darling. Whoever it is really thinks you're brilliant. Brilliant. And oh. the very British style and culture that seeps in is a fun, if sometimes confusing edition. That's me. So you give them what he wants. <laughs> I'm the confusing edition. Anyway, I haven't had to Google this many British cultural references since my last watch of Fry and Laurie. <laughs> well, I hope we're not too British because we think of ourselves, both Susie and I, as world people, don't we? Yes. We are Yes, world. I yeah. hope we are international, despite our aerophobia. And we do think, I think, of English as the lingua franca of the international community now. It is. What's lingua franca mean, actually? Lingua franca means the sort of free language. So it's kind of the one that everybody is free to use or can use. But we have got a whole episode on whether or not English will be the lingua franca in years to Ooh. come. But yes. What um, our fan in New York City is wondering is this. The origin of family member words. Why is a cousin a cousin, father a father? And why is there no gender neutral word for niece and nephew. Hmm. Uh, and why are grandparents called that instead of great parents? Only after grandparents do we add great. And is it a coincidence that the term for relatives from generations past is such a positive word, great and grand, rather than forebears? Yes, I think there's possibly a bit too much to answer in all of that because it's an, almost an entire episode, the names for family members. But very quickly, father is from Vater, brother is from Bruder. So we're talking about Germanic influences here. Lots and lots of siblings, of course, in other languages. Um, and again, we could go down lots and lots of wonderful alleyways with this one. Cousin is from the Latin consobrinus, which was the mother's sister's child but actually by the time it came into English it was the child of an aunt or uncle. Nephew is from nepos in Latin hence nepotism was originally favouring one's nephew also reflected in Bob's your uncle mm. and there is a kind of informal term which is gender neutral for nieces and nephews as a kind of collective and it's nibblings Oh, as in siblings, but nibblings. Nibblings. And they've been used for quite a long time, actually. Or the word has been used for quite a long time, but it's a bit resistant to going in the dictionary. I'm not quite sure why. Or yeah, as in dictionary makers are resistant to putting it in. But nibblings is around, and I quite like that one. And then on the grand and the great, I think less to do with praise, although we all love grandparents and great-grandparents, and more to do with size as of distance so grand came in simply from the french grand this simple borrowing and it was simply one step removed so the distance becomes greater if it's grand it's a distance between your if it's a grandparent between your parent it's one step further if you like so it's it's putting distance between your father and the generation that went before. I'm not explaining this very well. And great, I mean, I guess we needed to distinguish, obviously, between grandparents and you can have grand-grandparent. I think that would be a bit odd. But great, I think, again, probably in the sense of another step, another sort of distance. So you're looking at people far removed from you in terms of ancestry. So that's a really bad exclamation, uh, explanation of the kind of formal family relationships. But there are so many different nuances in the all of these. All my eye and Betty Martin is what Fraser Waterfield wants us to talk about. The phrase I've always been curious about is the one used by my late Nan, Hilda, from Walsall in the West Midlands. If someone had told her a story that she did not believe, she would tell us afterwards, well, of course, that was all my eye and Betty Martin. 
It was usually used in the context of a story where the teller was trying to elicit some sympathy for themselves, but was clearly rubbish, or at the very least over-embellished. When I asked her who Betty Martin was, she didn't know. Do you have <laughs> any idea about the phrase? She also used to say, all my eye, as a shorthand for the same thing. That's Fraser from Bourneville. Not sure that all my eye was actually the shorthand, because I think it all began with the exclamation, my eye. As in, you know, you're, you're pulling a fast one or don't think I'm going to believe that. So I think it's an elaboration of that all my eye or simply my eye, meaning nonsense. So much debate over this one. And I regularly get asked this by viewers of Countdown, actually, where does it come from? So it's obviously still used by older generations, but not, I think, being picked up by younger ones. It's also used in the sense of you wish you know, and, and in various different ways. But who was Betty Martin? So some people say there was a historical Betty Martin, who was uh, a woman in Shrewsbury, who was said to have punched a constable in the eye. I think that one's very far-fetched. Another <laughs> Betty Martin from Kent, apparently, <laughs> used to dress up like a ghost to scare her neighbours. And her name became a byword for fraud, but again, very unlikely. But the most famous explanation, which is the one I usually give, he said it goes back to a Latin prayer, which supposedly began Ora pro mihi beata Martine, meaning pray for me, blessed Martin. And that would be addressed to St. Martin. St. Martin, who, of course, as we've said in previous episodes, was a wonderful man, a soldier who gave half his cloak to a shivering beggar. And he cut, literally sliced it in half with a sword, gave his half to the beggar. And his half was kept in a shrine for people to come and pray at. And those shrines were called Capella from Little Cape and eventually gave us the word chapel. And indeed mm. chaplain as well. But anyway, same St. Martin was actually the patron saint of drunkards as well and tavern keepers. And it's said that if you were to say your Latin phrase or, or prayer quite sloppily and perhaps even drunk, Orama Primi Beata Martin might come out as all my eye and Betty Martin. There's a catch here though, Giles, which is that no formal prayer has been found within the church and the form of the Latin isn't quite right. But there is some evidence of prayer books having sort of similar things, particularly with Beata Martini, Blessed Martin, which might explain the Betty Martin. That's where I'm sticking because I think, you know, this theory has been around for a very long time and I think there probably is some truth to it. What you say goes with me, Susan. <laughs> it's a very long answer to that. No. But it's it, fascinating it, digging it in. Is, it is fascinating and intriguing, and St Martin is a riveting figure. Have you got three interesting words to introduce us to at the end of this week's podcast? I have. Now, do you remember last week I talked about the Milver, which you said you were, which is somebody who constantly talks through a movie and uh, really annoys the other people trying to watch? Well, this is... <laughs> Quite similar, but it's people who make noise from the sidelines that kind of interrupt your performance. And it was originally applied to acting, but I think you can use it in wider context of somebody who just, you know, is really annoying because they're giving you advice. So say you're on the telephone and somebody's telling you what to say, so you actually can't hear a word that's being said by the speaker on the phone. This is quonking. How do you spell that? N-K-I-N-G, quonking. Great word. This is happening Noise all from the, the time to me. Quonking, yes. stop that quonking. Oh, my exactly. goodness, I love it. Unwelcome noise from the sidelines. Then there is snooch, which I love it because it's quite onomatopoeic. And to snooch is to speak through the nose. You know, some people have got really nasal voices mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's called snooching. And how do you spell that one? Um, S-N-O-A-C-H. S-N-O-A-C-H. Yeah. Snooch, to snooch, to, to speak through your nose like that. Is that a nasal speaking? I'm <laughs> exactly. snooching now. I'm snooching. snooching. I was tempted to quonk it. I'm, an, I'm a natural quonker, but I don't mean to be. Uh, and it does annoy me when people do that. And what's your third word, Susie? The third one is, most people know that Nike is the goddess of victory, hence the brand. But there's a great word, Nikedonia. N-I-K-H-E-D-O-N-I-A, Nikedonia, and it's the pleasure of anticipating victory. Mm. Nikedonia, oh, there Nikedonia. you go. Nikedonia. Well, I've got a little poem for you this week. I just thought of it, in fact, because you mentioned St. Martin, and this is a poem by a man called John Bratburn, who was an incredibly prolific poet and an interesting figure, died a few years ago. People are wanting him to become a saint, a lot of okay. wonderful work in Africa. 
but he wrote some charming poems, and I thought you might quite like this one, and it's particularly appropriate for people who might have phobias about creepy crawly things, because maybe you shouldn't have phobias about creepy crawlies. Anyway, the poem's called Of Creepy Crawlies. O oh, snails and beetles, worms and grubs, ladybirds and slimy slugs, though you're very down to earth, that does not decrease your worth. But for you, tall shrubs and flowers could get no good from sun and showers, because the undergrowth would be too thick for them to grow and see. Nice. I like Sweet. this. It's a slightly unexpected ending, actually. I like that one. Yeah, he's an unexpected figure, John Bradburn, mm. and worth exploring. Good. I will look him up. Well, that's it, I think, for this week. Thank you to everybody, as ever, for listening. And please do get in touch, as Giles said, purple at something else.com. We are a Something Else production produced by Lawrence Bassett with help from Harriet Wells, Steve Ackerman, Ella McLeod, Jay Beale, and the porphyrophobe himself, Giles. Golly! Well, he hasn't been conking for quite a while.